Um, before I get started, there's a couple of things I'd like to say. First of all, um, I got you all here on a pretext. The first half of the talk is going to be about this. But um, because of all the work that I've done, that we've done throughout the West and also in Australia, I can't really talk about rock art without really wanting to put it into context. So the second half of my talk will have more to do with how I, um, in my opinion, how rock art fit into the lives of the people who made it. And that's a big different answer than what does that mean. Um, and if anybody wants to stick around for the second half and find out about that, then please do. There'll be a lot more of Australia about that because um, I have done um, 11 field seasons in Northern Australia. A couple other things I wanted to bring up. Um, first of all, there will be a little more information in this talk than I normally give in public talks because I've generally found that when I give talks to museum groups, they're generally a little better read than most of the public and um, are a little more um, inquiring and want a little more information. If you don't, just let your eyes glaze over, look at the good pictures and everything's fine. A um, Couple other things I wanted to bring up. Oh yeah, um, everything I'm gonna say tonight and everything that you've ever heard or read about or saw a movie of on human beings, on cultures, um, is way oversimplified. Everything I say tonight is gonna be way oversimplified because um, this stuff is way, way, way more complex than I'm able to talk about in an hour. Um, the other thing I'd like to say is I'd like to ask everybody a personal favor. I'd like you to please don't believe a single word I say tonight. <laughs> um, what I mean to say is don't believe what I say because you want to, because you like the presentation, you like my personality or not. Don't dislike, uh, agree with anything that I have to say because you don't like my talk or me. I'm going to ask everybody to practice this ancient ritual that human beings used to do way back before the internet. It's called critical thinking. Um, you can Google it. It's actually, um, all of our ancestors used to do this thing. Um, so uh, run everything that I say tonight past your own personal bullshit filter. Excuse me, sorry, I hope you don't have to edit that. Um, but, and, and really give it some thought because a lot of what I'm gonna tell you tonight goes against what you've heard other, particularly North American rock art researchers say. Uh, everything I say tonight is gonna fall pretty much in line with what Australian and most of the rest of the world rock art researchers say. But here in America, we actually really are considered like the poor stepchild in rock art research that we just have not, most of the rest of the world thinks that we just haven't caught up to them yet. And I'm one of those that believes that. So um, the thing is that there's a difference between data and an opinion. Tonight I'm going to give you a whole bunch of data, I'm going to show you how we interpreted it, and then I'm going to give you my opinion on that data, and then you can make up your own mind about it. But first of all, I'd like to thank the Society and all of you for inviting me down here and for coming out tonight in this horrible weather. And I would really, really like to thank the Paiute and Shoshonean peoples whose land this is, and their ancestors for being such good stewards of the land. And by the time we got here, it was in beautiful shape. And I think we can learn, um, part of my whole life is that I found out how much we can really learn from those peoples and their belief systems about how we can move better into the future than we are if we just follow our own. So I'm part of a small nonprofit group. Uh, any did, uh, donations are tax deductible, did I say we're nonprofit? Um, called Western Rock Art Research. We're dedicated to the research, education, and management of rock art resources, but we also do a lot of survey and all kinds of other stuff. Our fearless leader and the inspiration for all the work that we do is a man named Don Christensen, who has documented well over a thousand sites now, and I'll get into what real documentation means in a minute, but uh, now that I've studied world rock art quite a bit, I can honestly say that no human being has fully documented as many sites as that person there has. We met him, uh, my wife and I, down in the Mojave Desert when we took a job down there with the um, University of California at the uh, Granite Mountain Research Center in the middle of uh, the Mojave Desert. And that's where we first started working with him, but we also then, he's really more famous now for his work off in the Southwest and particularly on both sides of the Grand Canyon. Uh, we've worked in a whole lot of different areas, but I can say that presently the best book on rock art in North America, in my opinion, is this book right here. And I'm completely um, objective about that, um, just because he's my boss and mentor and inspiration. 
this really is the best book. It's on Amazon, very reasonable price, and I really believe it's also a very beautiful book. Got a lot nicer pictures than my book has back there, which is the second best. No, never mind. Um, so these are the places that our group has done documentation in. And documentation means a full archaeological documentation, and with what we do, not the stuff in Australia, but everything else, that includes drawing everything. We don't believe that photographs can give you enough information. So tonight, for the, especially the first half of the talk, I'll mainly be talking about our work in the Owens Valley, but also down into the Mojave, uh, quite a bit up and down um, the Great Basin. Um, I moved up to the Owens Valley in 1981 and found a job in the mid-'80s at the a White Mountain Research Station, and that's where I met my wife, my late wife now. We met in 86 or 7 and worked at the top of the White Mountains for 10 years, learning about archaeology there because Dr. Bob Bettinger was there doing his high altitude work. Fell in love with the whole idea and um, we're just back there, not a couple years ago there, but um, we went off, fanned out into the American West, uh, trying to learn more about archaeology, but we're just desert rats. We like to hike everywhere. Found out just how much archaeology, as you folks know around here, we live in a giant open air museum. There's tons of very cool stuff out there that can tell us so much about the other people that were here, um, but it needs to be recorded. It really, really needs to be recorded. So in the Owens Valley, uh, it's, it's where my wife uh, grew up. It's where I moved in, the, in 81. We finally, when Dawn headed back, we quit our job at the Granite Mountains because of our work in Australia, moved back to the Owens Valley and really focused on our American work was here. And like I say, we went to the, Owen, to the uh, Australia, met this one elder who asked us to help him record rock art there. And so a lot of the context that I'm gonna give for the rock art later will have to do with what we learned over there as well. So a few pictures of the type of rock art that I'll be talking about tonight. It's basically called Western Archaic, is the overlying tradition that covers pretty much all of the Mojave Desert and the Great Basin. There's a lot of different site-to-site -site differences, different things happen um, along with that. There are variations regionally, but in general, all these other little styles grow out of this bigger tradition. The Kosos is a classic example of something, though, that grew out of this style. What happens in the Kosos is not what's going on in the rest of the West. I hope everybody understands that. The Kosos is something completely different from the rest of the Mojave, except for there's a lot of, of this type of stuff in the Kosos stuff, but that tradition that we think of, of the being the Kosos stuff, that is very unique to this very localized area. So a lot of the stuff in the Owens Valley, we believe, is very, very old, but we also believe that, like at the, in the Kosos, it was made relatively recently, and a lot of this scratch stuff, which I know there's a tendency now to call it pneumic scratching, a, terminology that I'm really against, along with my, a lot of my pneumic friends. Um, I think that some of it is, but we should define it before we start giving it a name like that. Nobody has defined it. So a lot of the rock art in, everywhere is very faint and hard to see. Most of all the pictures I'll show you tonight are of the brighter stuff, the stuff that you see in magazines, but we really believe in doing drawings because an awful lot of the details are missed if you just rely on photographs. And just like in the Kosos, there are multiple levels of um, use of the same rock panel, and you, you really can't suss that out with just a photograph. You really need to do drawings of it. So we've been doing this for 25 years with Don Christensen, and then in 2005, we started going to Australia. And even on panels that are relatively easy to see, where there's a lot of detail shows up, there's a lot of stuff that you're not going to see unless you take the time to sit down and draw it and look very careful and notice that, for instance, in this panel, there's several places where there's little tiny traces of red pigment in the petroglyph line, showing that in the Owens Valley, at least, nearly 40% of all the sites show some use of red pigment as well. So I'm not going to get into pictographs tonight very much. Um, I'd like to do a whole uh, talk about that, but we have this really cool thing called D-stretch that we use now. You can see a little bit of red there, but if you use this program and you push the button, it really pops out stuff that even sitting in the cave you can't see. And it was uh, created by one of our board of directors, John Harmon, and the way that pictographs are recorded all over the world is changed because of this really cool program that he offers for free. So when I got into all this in 96 uh, is when we began working really seriously with rock art. 
We fell right in the middle of what's called the rock art wars. Everybody, uh, if you get any books, bookshelf of rock art, you'll find that somebody's claiming why all the rock art was done for shamanism, or all of it was done for fertility, or all of it was done for, you call it, archaeoastronomy or whatever. And fortunately, I ran in with the wrong crowd, and this guy here only ever had one question, really, about the rock art, is what else were people doing here besides making rock art? How did it fit into their lives? He doesn't care what that particular glyph means. I don't either. I want to know how did it fit into their lives. So that's always been my question, and that's context. Biggest word in research, any kind of research, is context. So there's a kook factor. Most archaeologists don't want to talk to rock art people because most of us are kooks. <laughs> um, because in the development of American archaeology, and there's some argument here, but in general, this is the development of, the way archaeology was studied in America. And so there was a time that we were doing a description, there was a time that we were doing chronology, there was a time that we were looking at context and function of things, and then there's a time for the explanation and the interpretation. Well, in rock art research, what did we do? Well, in the 40s and 50s, we started to describe it, but it's going to take lifetimes of people, and I'm never going to get famous and can't write any books. So we started chronology, and, class, and that's going to take lifetimes of hard work, and I'm never going to sell any books. Context, no, 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 I'm just going to start saying what it means, and I'll sell a whole bunch of books to people who don't do critical thinking. And that's where we are in America today. You can buy a lot of books on rock art that tell you what it means. None of them were written by a Native American, I might add. Um, no context. All of those books ignore the context of everything. So, in the Owens Valley, this is just a, some numbers to give you an idea of what's out there. There's, we've documented uh, about 150, uh, getting closer to 200, but there's at least another 150 on Forest Service lands, say another uh, 200 almost, counting DWP and in, within Death Valley. So there's a lot of uh, fine grain documentation that still needs to take place. So just to kind of, don't want to throw too many numbers and make anybody's eyes glaze over, but in this particular, looking at 122 sites, give or take about 8,000 elements, look at how many anthropomorphic or quadruped, deer or sheep or human figures there are, right? Not very doggone many out of 8,000. So when people start talking about, oh, it's all a bunch of pictures of people shooting bighorn sheep, even in the Kosos, there's only a handful of pictures of anybody shooting the sheep. There's a lot of sheep, tons and tons of them, but there's only a scant handful that actually show a hunting scene. There's almost none anywhere else in the Mojave and the Great Basin, seriously. Also, what else were they doing? Well, it turns out that contrary to popular belief, they were actually doing an awful lot of archaeology. They were living in a lot of these sites, too, doing all kinds of other stuff. And we would expect to find a big cluster of the site. The, this is just a, anecdotal. It really doesn't tell us much, but you'd expect to see more of them down here. That's when more were made. And, but there is actually a cluster more back, call it 1,500 to three or 4,000 years or 5,000 years ago. There seems to be a cluster of artifacts around that time. And I think the Kosos, actually a lot of the work that has been done in the Kosos by a few people has been very good at showing that um, at linking to particular time periods of rock art production, in my opinion, to uh, what other things that people were doing, mainly flaking obsidian. So in the Owens Valley, the 10 largest sites that we know of in the Owens Valley, that's the number of panels. A panel is basically whatever's big enough for you to do a drawing and fit on an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper or take a photograph that will give you most of the details. And um, all but three of them are on the volcanic tableland north of Bishop. A couple are in the central part of the valley at Crater Mountain, and then the one, the Swansea site, may well have been the largest one around, um, but it was nearly destroyed by um, people taking that rock away for building of roads and everything. So to just show you the difference between the Kosos and surrounding areas, just um, comparing nine sites from the surrounding areas, 90 sites in the Kosos, there's, uh, 67 anthropomorphs, 40 of them in the Owens Valley, 30 of them with just two sites in the Kosos. But the quadrupeds, look at that. All but 47 were come from just two sites that we recorded in the Kosos. We've only recorded three sites in the Kosos now, I think. Um, but there's a much bigger amount of quadrupeds. So I'm going to show you pretty much an image of every single quadruped and 
anthropomorphic human-like figure in the Owens Valley. If you don't blink, they'll go by fairly fast, but some of them do seem to go back pretty far in time. That's a north-facing panel, um, and the patina forms very, very slowly. We think that some of these are um, s at least several thousands of years old. But we think that they were also, even though there's a very few percentage of them, we believe that some of them were made more into more recent times. And this one panel at the most famous uh, real public, well-publicized site has more of the things that you would associate with seeing down here in the Kosos than anywhere else in the whole Owens Valley, pretty much that panel and a couple others coming up. This is a couple other little things. The thing up in the upper left, it sort of looks like what folks down here call a medicine bag, what we've never ever found an archeological example of one. Um, <laughs> so it's kind of weird to call it that, but uh, here's another panel that the, it's hard to tell here, but a couple of the curvilinear elements are much more recent than the, all of the quadrupeds there. That's a really untypical panel. Here's another one that's very or atypical. That you just don't see these very often. There's a handful throughout the Owens Valley, but um, in general, it's the wavy line, uh, dot patterns, so all the, this kind of stuff. Also, tracks, track lines. We have three examples, I think, in the whole Owens Valley. So, kind of want to say, okay, those are uh, artiodactyl deer or bighorn sheep or pronghorn tracks with the little dew claws on the back. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I don't do interpretation, but I would say it looks like that. The same thing with the panel that's very famous up there. There's one of those there. This is a panel that was completely pecked out, completely repatinated. And when you go see it today, what you're looking at is where somebody more than 100 years ago came by and re-pecked or braided the whole thing out. If you look close, you can see that somebody in prehistoric times re-pecked that panel, as well as the big, what's known as Skyrock up there. Both were done that way. So in the Owens Valley region, we have these communal game drives quite a number of them actually, even extending into historical times where there's still an awful lot of the um, timber parts of the, of the game drives because they're piled, they're rock lines, and, but they, those rocks were used to hold uprights of things like um, you know, uh, juniper mostly, um, stumps and, and branches. So this is a classical V-shaped uh, communal game drive of which there's four or five out on the volcanic tableland. It's for a place where they'd be chasing game into something that pinched to a point, and there'd be hunters there for it. And it's pretty tall rock walls, this one in particular. Not all are, but it's pretty high, and if you can imagine, there would be all kinds of dead brush and branches and everything else worked into that. And also, the landscape would also have had a lot of trees on it. So in the rock art record, I don't think, believe there's anything to describe the use of those. This is the closest thing, and maybe, and I certainly would never put in a paper or really put this forward that that's a game drive, but it's the closest type of a thing. There was an anthro chasing a couple, but very iffy. Another one, this image right here is actually in three places in the literature is depicting an anthropomorph shooting a bow and arrow. Is that what you guys see? Because that's not what it is. And in three different places, it's in the literature saying that the Owens Valley is covered with pictures of Native Americans shooting bows and arrows, and that's what's held out of the only one that's held up as an example, which when you draw it, it actually ends up being what appears to be a male figure, what looks like carrying sort of a burden basket type of a thing. Where do you get somebody shooting a bow and arrow? We do not have any pictures in the Owens Valley of any human throwing or shooting anything. And I just showed you the only ones of them interacting with quadrupeds. So this is pretty much all of the anthropomorphs that I haven't shown you already in the Owens Valley. And they're mostly stylized if you take a look at them. There's not a whole lot that you could say, oh, that's just a straightforward representation of a human. No, they're pretty stylized. If you wanted to really draw a human, you think you could do, anybody could do um, just a basic job. So, shamanism and the, the so-called sympathetic hunting magic are the two big theories that everybody wants to hold up for the Kosos and everything else in the West. And these are the things that people have always used to support those arguments. They're all about pictures of people killing quadrupeds. Well, it's not what we have. Its location is always along game trails or else it's way out somewhere. Well, we'll look at that one too. There's a big lack of habitational debris. Well, we're gonna look at that one too. And oops, that last one, we'll get around to it. So about the iconography and hunting magic. As we've already seen, even including the Kosos, there are not very many darn depictions of anybody hunting anything in North America. 
And the ones that are generally are not the hunter-gatherer folks. They're the Paiutes or the Navajo or um, Utes or somebody else. It just doesn't happen in the desert cultures much. The other thing is in the iconography for shamanism, they say, well, the anthros are supernatural looking and they're hunting, flying, coitus, having sex, or the so-called entoptics, which in my opinion is a non-argument because there's nobody has clearly stated what non-figurative designs are entoptics, if anybody knows, or um, that aren't. So it's, it's until somebody does their homework, we can't really talk about that. So not only in the Owens Valley, but we've also worked, done a lot of work down in the Mojave, four different regions that we've looked at. It's been right at two to three percent of the total iconography is anything that you would call representational. Humans, animals, vulvaforms, hands, feet, all of that is always only about two to three percent. Um, so that really doesn't hold very true. The other thing about the location of being along game trails, well, when you actually go out there before you write the books and you do your homework and you spend your time in the trenches, 20 years of it, and find where all the sites are located, they're located all over the darn place. There does seem to be a proclivity towards uh, travel corridors and sometimes um, at places where good resources come together and a bunch of other things, but every time that you come up with some type of a model like that, then you go look in those areas and well, there's nothing there. So. Um, they, they occur all over the place, a wide, wide range. The only place we don't see hardly any is up at high altitudes. It's the only place in all of North America we have very, very little rock art at high altitudes, although we have plenty of archaeology at high altitudes. So the other thing is the lack of habitation debris as, being, as supporting both of those two theories. Well, in the Owens Valley, 80% of our rock art sites show that people were doing other things there besides just making rock art. And a lot of what they were doing is milling, which those same hunting advocates claim only women ever ground food and no woman ever sharpened or flaked tools. And you're like, wow, where did you come up with that? Because again, working with Aboriginal folks, everybody needs to know how to do everything. Um, and the idea of a woman not knowing how to sharpen her own knife is beyond sexist as far as I'm concerned. Um, regional ethnography, there is very darn little of it anywhere that specifically relates to the rock art. Uh, some people try to make it up, and in particular with hunting magic, as far as I have found in all my looking at everything, the only real sympathetic hunting magic, I'll draw a picture and there'll be a spear through it, and then it'll happen tomorrow when I go, the only place I've ever found that is in a Tarzan movie. It really does not show up in any ethnography from any group that I'm aware of. So in my opinion, that ethnography has been horribly misused um, and uh, we need to stop doing it. Um, so here's an example of how, in my opinion, it's misused. Here's an example from 2005 that uh, someone who has worked here in the COSO said that among Numic speakers in the Great Basin, sorcery powers appear to have been symbolized by vulvaform motifs, which are restricted to a few specific sites this example is from the Chalfont site, Owens Valley, California. I happen to consider this researcher to be a classic example of someone who's never gone out there and recorded a ton of sites before he started making claims. And in this particular case, for instance, three years earlier than, or two years earlier than his quote, we had published in American Rock Art Research Association Journal a fact that showing that almost half of all the sites that we were working on in the Owens Valley did in fact have them. That's not restricted. That is probably the most common of all representational elements to be found anywhere in the Great Basin. And we feel fairly comfortable. It doesn't mean it was always meant to represent that, but we have found cases where it's in an anatomically correct place. We, so we feel fairly confident in saying that whatever they were supposed to be a symbol of, that they are on some level representing a vulvaform. In the same volume, Whitley says that Chalfont identified water baby, a rock baby. We've heard of them around here in the as being the shaman's helper and supporting his shamanic belief system. Well, I went backwards and forwards and back and forth through Chalfont's book. I could find exactly one example of him ever mentioning anybody, anything to do with rock babies, and it had to do with this uh, rock panel out in Rock Creek, north of Bishop, claiming how a little child was taken by the rock babies and was allowed to be turned into a spirit that would go into the rocks only if and that that was a reward that you get only if you were brave and strong. It was, well, that sounds like a whole bunch of stories I've heard in Australia, more like than anything 
to do with shamanism and male shamans doing hunting magic. What the heck? So this is one of the only panels in, um, in Round Valley that they might be talking about. That was a 1925 quote from Chalfont. So that sounds a whole lot like what I'm about to show you that people in Australia do. Okay, so why do I do what I do and why am I so uh, obsessed with it? The easy question is because there's a lot of ass, uh, idiots out there, <laughs> excuse me, um, who just don't respect other cultures, don't respect the natural world out there, and this stuff really, really needs to get recorded, in my opinion, because we're losing it all the time. Um, the, the, the panel that got me involved in it was this one here that I came to visit the site one day and it was just gone and I came back wanting to find out if they knew what was on it and they said, well, no, nobody's ever recorded it. Who would pay for it? That was a good question. I couldn't answer it. This particular site that everybody knows about was actually vandalized three separate occasions on Christmas four years ago. Um, and we need people out there, basically. We need to get the stuff recorded. We need to, as a culture, be willing to put more, invest more into protecting these things. So the famous site in 2012 that was vandalized, these are the panels that were vandalized at the Chalfont Valley site. There was no record there. That's the largest site in the in Owens Valley. It's 350 panels or so. In my opinion, these people were trying out their tools to see if it would work so they could go destroy something on basalt. Um, fortunately, we were the only ones that had been supposedly recorded four times in history, but we had the only um, images that actually showed those panels, despite all those other recording efforts that were used to go into the paper, and um, we, those, those panels were all returned. We have not caught the people that did it, but we will. Um, but it could have been much worse. Some of the panels, as you might know, out at Chalfont Valley are really, really remarkable, and um, they didn't try any of those. They just tried little corners on edges of of little things. So if you ride these things and you stay on roads, I'm not talking about you, please don't take this personal. If you're one of those people that goes off roads like these folks, you're my an mortal enemy and you're not only destroying the natural resources but you're destroying the cultural resources and if I can find you and find a way to get you put in prison I will do it because these are the people who are just destroying um, what belongs to all of us. And again, if you're a person that stays on the road, fine. I would just ask, why don't you tell your buddies that don't to start behaving like human beings? Um, really, I have seen more of the country torn up from these people that seem to have no respect at all for this planet that gave birth to all of us. So there's my little political thing. The other thing is, <coughs> as I said before, we live in this open air museum and every single one of these things that's out there can teach us so much about the people that were here before. But as soon as it gets put into a pocket, I used to be an arrowhead collector before I realized what was going on. Um, it's gone forever. We've just, uh, that, I've just now stolen something from every future human being that will ever live. And so this stuff has to get recorded. We need to work together to do that, to pass it down to the generations to come after us. And again, all in my opinion. Um, but taking it home, is, we're just losing that. And the other thing that I'd really like to push forward is that the most valuable cultural resource that we have on Earth is the still living traditional values of the people that still remember what it was like to be part of the country, their homeland. And in, again, in my opinion, I really believe that our culture can learn a whole lot from these folks about how to respect ourselves, how to take care of each other, and how to take care of our homeland, whatever that might be for each of us. So what is a hunter-gatherer? That's a question. In our society, we kind of have some weird ideas of just what a hunter-gatherer is. If you ask any 10 people, you might come up with some really bizarre answers. But the truth of it is, everybody in this audience has more relatives that made rock art than ever drove a car talked on their phone, used a computer or anything. At best, I don't care who you are, the most white nationalist only has 200 to 300 relatives or ancestors who were not hunter-gatherers. But every single human on Earth had at least 6,000 to 10,000 and maybe quite a bit more modern human ancestors who were hunter-gatherers. And I, I just really think that we should not ignore all of the knowledge that those people for 99% of all human history 
put together and just throw it out and act like it doesn't have any bearing on us. Because I really have come to believe by studying things on more of a worldwide basis that all indigenous people everywhere, despite all their really cool differences, shared an awful lot of basic um, things in common and that their lives were every bit as important, they were every bit as vital to their friends and family and that their lives were every bit as meaningful as any of ours. And for us to act like they're not or to act like it's human nature to be violent or to be liars or cheaters is ignoring a ton of evidence, a mountain of evidence that shows that our ancestors mostly spent most of all of their lifetimes were figuring out ways to rationalize, work together, take care of each other and to take care of their lands. That's really what the archeological record, the ethnographic record, everything we've ever learned about anthropology tells us is that um, people actually, the amount of time they spent fighting is minuscule compared to the amount of time they spent getting along with each other. And I really have come to believe that the pinnacle of humans getting along with each other happened in Australia um, and maybe a whole bunch of other places on the planet and I'm gonna show you why in just a little bit. And I'm by no means the first person to notice this. I'm very proud to say that right now our data from the Owens Valley and hopefully soon our data from the Mojave is being used by these folks from the Museum of Western Australia in Perth to do the first um, global study of arid lands rock art. And they believe, just like uh, I do, but it was Aussies that figured this out first, that there are some similarities that are way too big to ignore, and they're starting to look into that. I'll show you that in just a minute. So, in 2005, my late wife and I were invited by a couple friends to go visit Australia, the rock art mecca of the world, just to be tourists and to see some rock art. And I knew that there were some real big similarities between desert rock art, but I also knew that there were a handful of people over there who had grown up traditional lives learning about all the stories that went with their rock art, and I just wanted to meet one of them. And we really hit the jackpot. We met this person, Edum Duma Bill Harney, the senior elder of the Wardaman people in the top end of Australia. And he did grow up until he was in his 20s in these shelters, living a traditional life, napping tools and everything else, and learned all the songs and stories that his elders knew and was charged throughout his life with trying to pass that on. He asked us to come over there when we originally went over to start work, we thought, well, maybe we'll have enough money to do this for a couple of years, see if we can make any kind of a, um, draw any kind of inferences and see how we can help them. But we had no idea that we would be getting involved with the community and of people that still consider those stories and those songs to be a, a vital part of their lives and who they are. And it really is that the dances, the songs, the stories, the, the direct individual connection of people to their land is a living thing there that I really recommend uh, anybody that wants to see it. There's still lots of places on earth where people, including around here, where people have that connection. Young people still um, look for mates by showing their prowess and understanding um, the, store, the dances and the songs and the stories of their ancestors and showing their uh, commitment to passing that on. So this is Senior Wardaman Elder Edum Duma Bill Harney. He's considered a national treasure in Australia for a bunch of different reasons. He's an artist and a storyteller and a musician and everything else. But something to remember is that this is by the guy who founded the International Federation of Rock Art Organizations, that rock art is a worldwide phenomenon. It should be studied with a global perspective. Everywhere that there's rock and people live, they made native hunter, hunter gatherers, um, they made rock art and we should not look at ours all by itself. Okay, so for these numbers are different now actually. Uh, for at least 2.5 million years we've been making stone tools. Even though we've been around for what, four plus million? Um, but now that number's different. It's 60,000 years now. We actually have rock art going back to about 60,000 years. Um, the reasons why I think that we should compare Australia and the New World is that they kept that hunter-gatherer lifestyle throughout Australia and here in the United States, they kept it here throughout uh, in the Great Basin and the Mojave right up until the time of European contact. And that when they migrated to the New World and when they migrated to Australia, they came from somewhere else. They had already evolved into modern humans, that they had apparently already developed both symbolic and visual systems, 
and that they, repeat, they repeatedly adapted over and over to major environmental changes. And here with all of our big lakes and everything, we know we have had those kind of changes here. That's one of the big questions that I've always had is how can we relate the kind of adaptations they made in Australia with the kind of adaptations we made here. So we call this stuff Western Archaic here. In Australia, their big tradition is called the Panoramity. They both seem to go back in time the furthest and also come into contact times. They also cover the greatest amount of ground of any other styles throughout, and um, they are non-figurative. So here's what we're talking about. Both with the pictographs, the paintings, and the petroglyphs, the carvings on the rock, in general, it's mostly non-figurative. There are some human-like figures, some snakes or lizards, some quadrupeds, mainly bighorn sheep. There are some deer, although they seem to be way less common almost everywhere. Um, and that's down in the Mojave Desert. In the Great Basin, all across the Great Basin, you basically have the same thing. And while you do have uh, quite a bit of site-to-site -site differences, in a general way, Statistically, it's a really homogenous uh, tradition of rock art. The same type of things are used everywhere. And again, there are bighorn sheep, and here in the Kosos, there's this thing that went on that um, is, is different from what went on in other places, in my opinion. So you go to Australia, you go to the desert, what does their rock art look like? Well, it doesn't look similar to our rock art, Statistically, it's just about identical. And yet we're pretty sure these folks were not talking to each other um, or sending smoke signals or anything else. So what's going on here? And again, if we ran into this, I just did a bunch of work over uh, in Zion, we wouldn't even bat an eye. This is the same stuff where once you get to Zion, it turns into something else. That's right about where this style dies is right there. But circles are probably the number one thing that was pecked by or created by hunter-gatherers across the world, and yet it's the hardest thing to peck. A straight line is much easier. So that's Australian rock art. And again, that's identical to what we find here in the Great Basin. The site-to-site -site difference between any two sites a kilometer apart is greater than the site-to-site -site differences between ones across the other side of the globe. Here in North America, we know that a type of this rock art at least goes back at least 7,000 years. This is stuff from South Central Oregon. There's a number of these panels where the pecking is all across it, across the whole panel. And there are a number of them where the toe of the panel goes down underneath uh, a clay pan, <coughs> a dried lake bed, and down un below and through a ash level that was laid down when Ma Mount Mazama erupted just about 7,000 years ago and keeps going quite a bit below. So um, we think that it's very old. I would like to make the case that even with the more figurative, the anthropomorphic styles in across the world, we also see basically the same sort of thing happening. These are not just pictures of people. This is Utah, but those are pictures of human-like figures. And you can go across our country. This is uh, West Texas, Pecos River area. They're human-like figures. They've got arms, little legs, head-like things, but they're definitely not just depicting a, just a human. Something else is going on there in the Grand Canyon. Picture doesn't show it, but there's little green, tiny eyelashes done with tiny paintbrushes and the one guy, it's really cool. Um, and then up in Wyoming, in uh, Wind River country, Dinwoody style, they're human-like figures, but I would make the case that there's something else going on there, that this is what our culture would refer to as supernatural or unnatural or something like that. Same thing, Wind River. And in this particular case, this panel here, the Wind River Shoshone believe that it speaks to a story that they have about a creation being, this woman that's weeping here, and these other beings that were her helpers in a story. They believe that it's a very, that this panel speaks to a very complex one of their creation stories. So we do have some information about some of the rock art here in North America. This is Navajo. And we have traditional owners that have told us about this type of stuff as well. This depicts creation beings, but it also depicts dancers in a modern dance dressed up like the creation beings who are actually becoming the creation beings during those ceremonies. And everything on their costumes, everything there has some uh, symbolic meaning 
that you may or may not know depending on how much you're part of that group of people or how initiated you are into that level of knowledge. So going to where we work in Australia. In Australia, um, the Wardaman people and other groups around believe that no human beings ever originally painted these. They believe these are the depictions of these creation beings who when their world changed into our world, they put their images, their shadows into the rock and their world turned into our world and each one of those became the different birds and plants and animals that we have today and their spirit is in the rock and in the animals and helping to guide us and teach us and give us laws and um, it's our duty. Hey, come back here. Wait a minute. So in Australia, there's also, across the whole continent, um, these more figurative styles where there are human-like figures that are involved with the traditional people, say, are involved with very, very complex, more often than not, creation stories or dream time stories. Same thing here. This is one you can see. Uh, it's an open site in Kakadu National Park. Again, this is very much like those ones I just showed you from the Grand Canyon, that there is no animal with antlers in Australia. What's going on up there? Multiple arms, elongated bodies, kind of like a bunch of the things you see in the Kosos, huh? And the stories that usually have to do with these panels have a lot to do with the interaction of the various beings back when the animals were Humans stood upright, were dressed up for ceremony, could talk with each other, and they're not just about conflicts. They're more often than not, all those stories have something to do with how was the conflict resolved? How did these people finally talk things out and decide to make things fixed or well again? So as I said before, Bill, um, until his early mid-20s, he grew up in a traditional fashion and then for the rest of his life was allowed to, uh, he was a stockman that was still allowed to go out on country with the old men and learn all the different stories. So he has all of this knowledge. And here's a, a real good one that those uh, symbols up on the left up over there that almost any American researcher would say that they're clearly symbols of the sun. Well, what Bill was told by his elders, he and all other young Waterman children of his generation were taken to this spot and told, that these are symbols for laws, that they're the women's laws, men's laws, the laws that we all have to live by. And this is a place where the children were sat down and taught those laws and how they were expected to abide by them. So that is not the answer that any of us would have figured out through the archeological record without a traditional owner. I don't think anybody could research or could say that they would have come up and known that that's a symbol from voodoo law without having a traditional owner tell them that. Here's another one that Bill was told. This type of a figure, they're only about yay tall, but only one shows up at a handful of the different 200 and some odd sites we've been to there. And Bill was always told that whenever you see that, part of the story about that site has to do with sign language. In the whole top end of Australia, if you don't speak the same language, somebody comes up to you, you hold up three fingers. And then you gotta start talking in sign language. So, okay, now that we know those various levels about society, you can put two and two together and maybe see where they're coming from. But again, without that specific knowledge, you're not gonna figure that out. These are Bill's paintings. He's also hanging in uh, galleries really all over the world. Um, all the big galleries in Australia. I happen to own this one right here. Um, anyway, this is the story, Bill's painting story of the fight between the two lightning brothers uh, that, they, that goes on every year that brings the thunder and the lightning. The only thing that looks sort of like a human up there is not any of the Lightning Brothers or the wives that came out to protect him. It's the little frog that crawled up on the rock to pee on them to cool them down while they were fighting. <laughs> I don't think any of us would have guessed that one either. So this is a painting that Bill did of two um, shields in the middle and two hair belts on either side, a, a head belt, hair belt and a waist belt. And it's much more than that because they're also, in the story he gave me about this, they're also endowed, endowed with, um, uh, with personalities. And that they, each one of these is depicting a, a, a being that's part of that ceremony. Well, what just happened? Oh, I wonder why they had it. Oh, okay. Anyway, um, so there's much more to it. All of these type of things. Okay, now I'm going to be talking about um, these are the images for the Walpuri people in the red center of Australia. And multiple researchers have worked with folks throughout the, the desert. They were told over and over and over again, 
that very simple things like a circle or a straight line, wavy lines at the bottom, can mean multiple, have multiple different meanings even in the same site. A circle over there doesn't mean the same thing as over here. And over and over, the researchers were told, these are only the non-restricted meanings, that this is less than half of what I, I know about the site, but I can't tell you any of the rest because you're not an initiated person and I can't tell you. Over and over they were told that. And this particular person, this Nancy Munn book, is probably the one that's most cited by Australian researchers. She spent some years working with these folks and found that the even very simple uh, elements can be used for four different types of rock art. Sometimes these are very separate types of rock art that don't overlap and they're, they cannot overlap. And other times, oh yeah, it's no worries, you can do that. But you, you have to know when. You really have to know and be part of that group of people to be able to understand what they're talking about. So here's the thing is that, like I said before, every group of people, every language is another way that that group of people learn to describe the world around them. And every time we lose a language, I think it's, it's a giant tragedy. But despite that, there are some basics that that you really, I mean, don't believe in the web because a lot of them, they're just throw together there. But if you really look around and do fact checking, you find out that some of them really do um, show up in the ethnographic record going way back for a lot of different places. For instance, um, something that got me because down in the Mojave, I was reading and finding out quite a bit where quartz crystals were used for rainmaking. With the Wardman people, it's a real big deal over there the other side of the world. And now I found that in other places as well. Same thing that stone axes in places and the boomerangs are associated with thunder and lightning and also with bringing the rain every spring. Um, stories about the rock art being made either by, not by people, but by earlier somebody and also taboos against speaking the names of the deceased for at least a couple of years. That seems to be a somewhat worldwide. Um, also that the earth was once completely formless there were no mountains, there were no rocks, there were no trees, and that all the humans and the animals looked a lot alike and that they conversed with each other and they did ceremonies together. And then a kind of a weird one that really is true when I know somebody who's really tracked down the original stories, that the, those um, Pleiades are called the Seven Sisters on at least four continents and they don't look like Seven Sisters to me. So my question is if that type of general beliefs were happening worldwide at the time of European contact, can we pretty much make a pretty accurate guess and say that they probably go back in time too? Because we know these people weren't talking to each other for a very long time. So it would seem to me that these type of beliefs probably go back in time. And the other thing is, if the rock art is that similar, can't we in a general way say that they were probably making it for the same types of reasons and did it, did it probably have the same levels of complexity, even if you can't say that circle meant the same thing here and there. But in general, I, I, I don't know of anybody who studies Native American rock art or Australian Aboriginals that says that we would say that either one is less complex in worldviews than the other. Um, I think anybody would say that obviously Native Americans are just as complex. So, the three takeaway points, sort of, are that um, very simple designs can have really complex meanings and be used for, to tell lots of different stories, that the stories concern all the different aspects of the traditional life of that country and how the, the, what we would call the real world fits into the, so what we would call the spirit world, and that it takes a lifetime to understand all those meanings. And us just trying to guess it when we're not even of that culture is really a form of racism. It's okay to just say, oh, I'm having a flight of fancy, but to put that in a book and call it science, in my opinion, is inherently, whether you, you're conscious of it or not, there is a racism at work there. Um, that you're, you're denying the complexity of the problem you're looking at. So I've been very, very fortunate that, um, in my opinion, the Bishop BLM field office is the best one in the whole West. Sorry, that just, we lucked out. Um, but there are others, St. George, there are others that I've worked with that are very, very good as well, and forest service groups that I've worked with as well. Now I'm working with the Zion National Park. But um, the future of the cultural and the natural resources in the American West, we all see what's sort of going on out there. We cannot rely on the government to take care of the things that we love anymore. It's, 
It's, it's going to take us stepping up to the plate. It's really the only way. So we can either watch them vanish and, and bitch about it and complain, well, if only they did a better job, or we can lock them up and put a fence around all of them, which I really don't want to see, or we can team up and work with the land managers and volunteer for them and do everything we can. I know I'm preaching to the choir because you folks are all here because you've been volunteering, but um, this is my spiel for the general public too that we need to work together and we need to help the land managers instead of just complaining to them and do whatever we can to help them. So to wrap the whole thing up, in my opinion, most of all the rock art that was made by hunter-gatherers was made to pass on knowledge and information and stories about how they got along with each other and how they were really, really connected to their country. That's a part that being uh, migrants ourselves, all of us that came here, um, we don't understand what it's like to have a piece of land that great, 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 great grandma did something right here. And imagine as much as a lot of you I'm sure have knowledge of this town and the amount of time that you've been here, imagine if it went back 10 or 20 or 30 generations or more, the kind of connection, personal connection you have to that land. I talk about the past mainly because I'm worried about the future. And I really, really believe, um, and so do my Wardaman friends and my Native American friends, that learning from these earlier cultures about how to be part of the world around us is something that we have to teach our children or they won't want to protect the world. They won't want their mother to keep going on for their children and their grandchildren and their grandchildren. They won't want to teach them the same connection. So it's us, up to us to do that, to get our kids out there, to expose them to being outside to what it's like to just listen. Do you hear that? Anyone who would go outside where there's no planes, no anything, there's a noise. The world makes a noise. Most of us never even hear it. But go listen for it with your grandkids, your kids, and try to pass it on. So anyway, um, did I mention that we're a nonprofit? Uh, all <laughs> donations are tax-free. There is also a, a bunch of other ways that you can help. There is a California Archaeological Site Stewardship Program that I know we really need help in the Owens Valley, and I'm sh sure that you do around here as well. I would um, really uh, stress that anybody that wants to help, you really, you can see more archeology span than you want if you go to the land managers, show them how serious you are and how you want to help. They, they, the people I work with have a budget way lower than they had 20 years ago, less staff than they had 20 years ago, a lot more stuff to take care of. And they need our help. So um, let's give it to them whenever we can. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes? Uh, you showed the, uh, that, uh, the mass, I guess, from the Shelfon or from the Bishop area, I guess it was the Shelfon area, the masks, were they destroyed when? when no. Nope. The question was about the big sort of shield-looking things at Chalfont. No, none of them were, were harmed. Anybody else? Come on. Let's see. Question about something? Yes, sir. Are they still looking for our back down in Red Rock Canyon? Do you know? I don't. Nope. Nope. What version of PowerPoint is this? This is really a good presentation, all the... It's Keynote by Mac. It's much better than PowerPoint, okay, got it. in my opinion. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. You didn't show very much from the Yellow Jacket site? No, I didn't. That's not supposed to be sort of shared? No, it could have. It's just that I, um, there are a whole bunch of pictures of that in my book back over there. Um, the question was just about a, a particular site uh, by Bishop Yellow Jacket. Yep. You didn't say about your book. Oh, yes, I have a book back there that uh, we put out just a couple of years ago, 2016, Rock Art East of the Range of Light. It has directions to one place, the uh, interagency office, where you can go get a map to the several sites. It does not tell you what it means. It doesn't tell you who made it, and it doesn't tell you when it was made, but it does tell you what the data is that we have um, to support theories that we have for all three of those questions. And um, it does have drawings of every panel that we've recorded, uh, 10,000 panels or 10,000 glyphs um, that you would call 
a composition for all the sites in the Owens Valley. So if you're interested, it, it's the first overview of rock art in our region since 65, um, and it has a drawing of uh, pretty much every panel up there that we've gotten recorded so far. Yes? Uh, the people you find in a certain area, uh, you know, indigenous people or like even the Paiutes, you know, in areas here, how, how do you, how, you don't really know how they're related to the people that were here. I mean, how, how can you go back by talking to these people, you know, who's here today, mm -hmm. and go back to a generation? The question is, um, how can we know about the rock art by the folks that were here now, the Paiute and the Shoshone? Um, through the archaeological record, we can see um, through their stories, the story is that they were here since the creation. Through the archaeological record, we see at least several thousand years that they were here. There's a good deal of that rock art was done in the last 2,000 years. So we know that it was the Paiute and Shoshone that made at least some of that rock art. See now, uh, we have a petroglyph festival. Yep. And, and a fellow Spike comes down from Bishop. <coughs> He had a book, the Kern County book, or the Kern research book that was done back in the early 80s, 82 or so, mm -hmm. where the Kern, the Kern report, they interviewed everybody they could find, you know, natives and so forth. And now Spike, and, and this book, this Kern book, I went out and got it off mm -hmm. the ABC books, and it, he claims that the petroglyphs were not done by his people that they were done by the water babies. You know, and that's, it's in that current book, and he's from that area, that's what he claims. Right, right. Well, the same way that the Waterman people, we know were there for at least 15,000 years and maybe much, much more, they claim that they never did it. They claim that creation beings made it. So that's, that's a story. Um, and w we definitely have lots of rock art in the Kosos. We have lots of rock art in the Owens Valley that were done in the last two to three hundred years. That had to, or the last thousand years, that had to have been done by the Paiute or the Shoshone that were here, or their immediate ancestors. Um, in that book, uh, Kern actually though was a botanist, and so archeology, span anthropology was not really his field. He asked a few questions, and that's actually much better data than the stuff from Chalfont. Um, but again, that's pretty much worldwide of people just saying, oh no, that goes back to the time of the, the whole world was created. And so that also lines up as being a fairly a, a worldwide type thing. And again, um, I still make the point that if people all over the world shared a bunch of these type of ideas, it, it seems to make sense to me that it probably goes back in time here. Um, and the people, if the people that we call pre-Numic were not the direct ancestors of the Paiute or the Numic, they were certainly the direct ancestors of some Native Americans. And so for us to say that, well, you know, they can't claim um, any connection to it, uh, I think is not a valid argument at all, that clearly they do, that Native Americans all over the um, North and South America um, made it, and that they probably have a much better idea of the, the basic uh, worldview of the people who made it than we'll ever understand. It's just my opinion. But, Oops. You mentioned that there was something different going on here with the Coso Petroglyphs. Can you just talk a little bit about that? Um, no, because nobody's figured it out yet. Okay. Um, the one thing that I do think that uh, David Whitley is cor correct on, in my opinion, is in, he was one of the people along with Ken Hedges and a lot of other people that said that <coughs> while there are an awful lot of sheep here, um, there really aren't that many depictions of them hunting them something else is going on here. And let's face it, there's a lot of depictions of sheep with giraffe necks and horns on both ends and 10 feet instead of two and um, things that we know there was never a bighorn sheep with 10 feet. Um, so I do believe that they're a, uh, a symbol for an idea and we haven't figured out what, what the ideas were. And I think that, I really do think that if, if again, if you want to, uh, as a, as a, um, just a playful thing, try to figure out, oh, I think it might be this, that's fine. But to actually ascribe that to the people who made it or the culture who I feel that that is still a part of, 
Um, I really think that that's doing them a disservice. It's one thing to say, well, this sort of looks like that, so maybe part of the story is this, and just know that that's the tip of the iceberg. But know that probably if, if you really could come back here with a, a grandfather, a grandmother, three generations, five generations ago, you would find out that, wow, there is so much more going on here. Um, and I, I give another talk where I show the, the, the depth of the knowledge that this elder that we worked with in Australia has, and it literally, every single living thing on a hundred mile circle of land, he can tell you about every landform, every spring, every species of animal, bird, plant, uh, soil type, rock type, you know, a meteorological condition. There is nothing in his country, including all the humans going back quite a few generations, um, that he doesn't have in his mind. And I think people here were like this, that as well. I really do. I don't think he was particularly special. Um, what's the characteristic of the coast of well, what's the kind of, you know, one characteristic or whatever that makes you say it's unique? The huge number of quadrupeds and anthropomorphs um, that occur here is just not the same anywhere else in the Great Basin or the Mojave. Within the, the, um, the question was, what makes Coso so different? And there is, there are time periods and places within the Kosos that is very close to the, Co the Owens Valley or places down in the Mojave or further to the east. But there are, it seems to me, more like two or maybe even three uh, fluorescences of rock art in the Kosos where people started or were doing huge numbers of quadrupeds, bighorn sheep primarily, and um, very stylized anthropomorphs. And you just don't see that throughout the, the rest of the Great Basin um, and the Mojave. If you go up to Black Rock Wells, north of here in the Saline Valley, yep. the Petrocliffs up there, I don't believe there's very many, if any, anthropomorphs right. up there. That's, I mean, the thing about the Kosos is also that there's uh, two other expressions like it. The Paranagate Valley um, expression of rock art and the... Um, well, the Wind River Shoshone are two other ones that are somewhat like the Kosos that we think grew out of the, the uh, Western archaic tradition for whatever reason. And um, the Kosos are, well, I guess all three of them are really localized, but the Kosos in particular, there's a few um, elements and panels down as far as Barstow that are clearly linked to the Koso thing. And then Black Rock Well is the furthest north um, that I would link to that. There may even be actually, um, I think that there are some as far down as um, 29 Palms, a couple of panels down there. But it's all pretty much really centralized around here. A little bit of, of part of it goes out into Death Valley and off in that direction and everything. But even, um, we just finished the, the biggest site in Saline Valley, 500 panels on the big site in Saline Valley. It has um, over 100 rock rings and over a thousand total rock features and 500 rock pan plus panels. Um, outside of the Kosos, it's probably the biggest rock art site in California or Nevada. Um, but there's nothing that you would really, there's no, no classical Koso sheep and it's just right over there and there's no classical Koso anthros either. Uh, one more question. Uh, here we've got the basalt where you can make petrographs or petrographs. If you go over on the coast where you've got sandstone and the people did pictographs because they did, you know, nothing would be preserved in the sandstone. They, uh, how, 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 do you, how do you look at that culture where you don't have uh, the, you know, the, the ancient work that you have over here? In other words, I think what I've heard, there, there's like there's a couple of thousand years maybe where they don't really have any evidence of human I, I don't. I don't believe so. I mean, uh, some, one of the oldest California skeletons came from the uh, Santa Cruz Island. So, um, no, they have a time depth over there. Something else. I mean, the the thing about all up and down the coast, uh, there's a, a good question there. There's very other, except for the Chumash, that stretch down there in the Southern Sierras. There's really not that much rock art end up in in the in the center of the Sierras, but down deep in a valley, American River, and down in there. Um, there really isn't that much rock art over on that side. And it could possibly be because they were doing so, so many other expressions in wood carving, painting, and 
other things like that. In the southwest, we also study all around the St. George area and into the Grand Canyon area. Sandstone there as well. In shelters, the sandstone will keep, or some of the sandstone, depending on how it's sheltered, uh, there are quite a bit of petroglyphs and pictographs um, over there. But the thing about this, this Western archaic tradition, as soon as you get north, it runs out right about south central Oregon. You run into the Columbia Plateau, um, and there, well, there are petroglyphs. For the most part, you run into a lot more pictographs and a lot more um, uh, figurative, a lot more faces. That's another thing is, you know, throughout the whole Mojave and the Great Basin, there are all very few faces depicted. These people saw faces every day. There must have been a reason why they couldn't depict faces. There's three in the whole Owens Valley or something. I'm not sure, that, I don't know of hardly any in the Kosos. Um, so this, this non-figurative style, I can, I can tell you what the theory in Australia for why those other styles developed, and I happen to believe that this is, if everybody wants to listen to it, um, why the Kosos had those fluorescences when they did, and I believe that the work that the um, folks, Amy Gilreath and those people did in the Kosos backs that up. <coughs> in Australia, they believe um, that the, the, the big expression of panoramity, our Western archaic that covers their whole big arid desert area, that they can explain why it's so alike by um, this theory that basically says, in the desert, you never fight other people. You fight distance and you fight the drought. You fight whether it's gonna be a good season or a bad. If it's a good season, everybody eats good. If it's a bad season, everybody starves. And so you need, you know, like from here to Death Valley or from here to Las Vegas, you need to have a visual and a world view, a ceremonial view to where you can send somebody over three valleys over and say, hey, we got no food this year. How are you guys doing? And they'll go, oh yeah, you're our brothers. Come on over, we got plenty, brothers and sisters. And then the same way, the other way around. When you, when things are good for you, you can um, share with what you've got. And in Australia, they believe that that's what they had. That's what that developed. And that once upon a time, just like here, the lakes in Australia were all full of water. And also um, the sea level was down quite a bit further and the, the mangrove flats went way out into the sea and there were big numbers of people that all lived way out on the mangrove flats and tons of people that lived around these lakes. Well, the giant drought came, the lakes dried up just like they did here, the sea level rose and um, it flooded all of that mangrove and all those people out there and all those people inland had to go somewhere and they ran, they headed for the coastal ranges. Well, the, those coastal ranges around the top end of Australia they see, through dating, they've seen that the big fluorescences of rock art, here in America, we've always decided, like here at Kosos, that wow, as soon as everything was getting good, all the resources were good, the population was going top, that's when everybody was doing all the art, because we all learned in school that you, we, there was no art until you had, you know, um, agriculture, and then somebody learned to make a pencil and a yada yada. Um, it turns out, no, we had art like, <laughs> hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of years before, they found out in Australia that actually all the fluorescences of rock art happened after the peak had hit and the resources were going down and the population was starting to crash, that that's where they see the big fluorescences of the rock art. And I believe that that's what, again, the work by Amy Gilreath and those other folks um, in comparing the times that the big collections of flakes were produced in conjunction with the sites, they were seeing that those were tending to happen on the downhill slide of those times rather than on the uphill slide the same way. And I think that, so basically what you need is when things are getting rough and you're consolidating back, like I've heard the Kosos described as being the hottest, driest place and that's why they're, well, not if you come from any direction around it. Kosos is pretty doggone nice. There's water up in there, there's resources up in there. It's, it's not like down here. Um, <laughs> but um, it's actually pretty well watered. It's a fairly nice place up there compared to the desert around it. So um, I think that that might have been what's happening there. It needs a lot more work to, to nail it down, but that perhaps some of those fluorescences were happening as a way to kind of say, hey, we're different here. You guys need to go back to the Owens Valley. You need to go back to Eureka, Death Valley, whatever the heck it is, but no, no, we're, this is ours some difference going on here. And that, again, that would only be one little piece of the story. There would be a whole lot more to it than that, I'm sure. But I think that that's part of it.
So, Sorry, nope. just a little bit embarrassing, but uh, <laughs> I keep wondering, uh, you're, you're saying that these figures, anthropomorphs, are telling a story. Or, I, I keep wondering, why are there not breasts on any of the animals? <laughs> In other words, they may not be depictions of people. That's, I, I personally don't think they're a depiction of just a person, male or female. I think that they're a depiction of a being that's like a person. Um, that's a very good question. In Australia, um, breasts are depicted across the whole continent. And um, in a North America, at least, I don't know that much about South America, um, they're hardly ever depicted here. Uh, just a handful. Or any other secondary sexual characteristic, clothes, um, hair, hairstyles. Um, they're just not depicted. The only thing we really have are the vulva forms. Very, very rarely are they on an anthropomorph. They're usually just by themselves. So, um, yeah, I, I would not consider them to be just people. I think they would have just drawn just people if that's what they meant to do. I mean, there's no depictions of anybody building a house. There's no depiction of anybody even uh, collecting plants or anybody uh, e sitting down to eat or all the things that they saw during a normal day are not depicted anywhere in the rock art, that has to be a clue right there. Yes? Has there ever been um, any Native Americans who had a continuous tradition that any U European or American historian could talk to, like you could talk to that Australian elder and figure out what his interpretation of it is? Chalfont says that by 1925, the last men in the Owens Valley that knew the complete songs had died mm -hmm. by 1925. So um, the elders that I've talked to in the Owens Valley and further north up by Carson City have told me that their elders told them to leave that stuff alone or they'll be killed. That, that, that joining the church is the only way that their family will survive and for them to just leave that stuff alone. And so, and I've been told that by numerous ones. So we see the same thing in Australia. The elder that we work with is in the vast majority. The only reason his people, he and his people weren't thrown out is because they were raising cattle during World War II for the army. But everywhere else in Australia, almost everywhere else in Australia, people were thrown off their land too. So the, the traditional knowledge lives, but the specific, site-specific knowledge um, is mostly torn away when people are ripped out of their homelands or when they have to do something else to survive in their homelands. Yes. That guy is kind of a lucky survivor. Right, right. And even he, his knowledge is probably just a fraction of what, uh, you know, he was taught by two uh, grandfathers that were considered to really have the knowledge, but um, it was just a, a weird uh, thing of events that one of his father's grandfathers was also a, uh, a boundary watcher, so he was instilled with all the knowledge of all of these sites. We made a, I do another whole story about showing you how you know, the guy knew 300 sites on his property and could tell you everything about them and how to get to every one and how to walk to every one of them and everything about it. So, um. What's sad and good is that some of the younger Indians want to learn the language, want to learn the old traditions, and they have to, a terrible time trying to find out this information because the, the elders are all gone. But they're trying, and I think that's pretty nice. These are people in there. Well, we've had them here at the, at the Pentagon Festival. Yep. You know, the, they're in their know, 40s and 50s and 60s, and they're trying to learn the old ways, and it's so difficult. Well, it's actually a big success story for the Owens Valley because for many years I was even told by a particular person that they would not teach any non-Indians at all, and now they have classes all up and down the valley at all different levels and all kinds of kids and everybody, there's retreats. It's really a success story that they are um, reteaching their... Yep. So. Yes? Um, do you believe that the close-up uh, that your glasses that were done by uh, shamans and, and headmen of the tribes from their trances that they went into? Um, I don't believe anything one way or the other. Um, the data that we have, no data has been presented to show that, in my opinion. I don't, I, it's, it's been a story, but no one has collected the data and presented it in a way that makes any sense to me. I don't, I don't see why there wouldn't be women making rock art, frankly. And um, other than the fact that it's been mostly men studying it, 
I don't even know why they would have even come up with that, frankly. So, no, it, do, it does not work for me that the most of the rock art was only done by people that are hiding when most of all those sites show that everybody was grinding food and making stuff and hanging out there and doing all kinds of other stuff. When it shows that everybody in the, in the village or the group of people was utilizing that site, it's kind of hard to say it was only done by a bunch of men that were out away from everybody. So no, I don't, I don't subscribe to that because I don't believe that the data has been presented in any kind of an objective way. For that? I, 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 agree, I agree with that, what little I know. But uh, I understand that the groups that lived here during, they were really not tribes. They were small groups that were 10 to 15 people at the most. Yes. Because the land, although it was much better then than it is now, there was a great deal here to support what they did, you know. But they weren't huge groups of people. And they were, they did this, it's not nomadic, but they did this seasonal thing. And yes, survival was what they were doing. You know, it was here in the summer, uh, there in the winter, or here in the winter, there in the summer, and they were surviving. They, they spent 90% of their time just surviving. Well, time out on that one. It actually, all studies that we've ever done on indigenous people show that as a general rule, even in vastly degraded environments, they spend, they have about 30% more free time than we modern people have, yes. They spend a lot of time dangling their kids on their knee and talking with their friends and hanging out. And it actually, uh, the, and it, another thing it turns out that in studying fossilized bones, um, we, A, we see a lot more old people than it used to be. Oh, they all died at 20. Well, then we sure as heck wouldn't be finding all these really old skeletons, because how did they live to be then? And, and they're all over the world. Um, and the other thing is that, um, yeah, that the amount of time really spent, um, they had really worked things out so well that yes, there were hardship times, but as a general rule, um, you know, all of us have gone through hardship times, <laughs> even, even in modern days. I mean, I hope none of you are not getting a paycheck this week. Um, but as a general rule, we just don't see, um, you know, we had expected to be looking at all these bodies and seeing evidence of malnutrition throughout their lives and things like that. We see really healthy people, even in the deserts of Australia, you know, the most arid place on earth, and somehow their skeletons show that these people never really did without. But there have been no skeletons found around here, have there? Um, that's a <laughs> tricky question. <laughs> Um, Arizona. Yeah, there, there are in various different places that we found them, but again, there seems to be um, <coughs> a lot more going on than, than what we expected. But you're totally right that there are smaller groups of people. They did almost everywhere, indigenous groups had around the once a year or once every few years a time when all the different groups did, and the lake was a really good place that people would come together to meet. But as a general rule, it was the smaller groups that were making a seasonal round, usually up and down. Um, the way we were seeing, and yeah, tribes, just like a lot of the words I use tonight, it's a word we came up with that just doesn't. It bothers me when they had the petroglyph festival here. The first year they, they had the big teepees. You know, <laughs> here at Kirk, Kirk, I mean, our, our people, our people, uh, they didn't live in teepees, and they, uh, they didn't even uh, tan their hide, or tan the hides, I don't think, uh, here too much, like they made, you know, the rawhide dresses and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. But they, I know they didn't live in teepees. No. But it's like everybody kind of thinks you think of Indians, you think teepees and, you know, all the stuff that you get out of Hollywood. So it's really hard, because we do docent programs at the, at the museum, and it's really hard to get these kids sometimes to understand they're not talking about John Wayne and, <laughs> and Tex Ritter and, you know, all this stuff. It's just entirely different. But why did they have all those teepees and everything here? There was, yeah. that was, it was showing. <laughs> it was a Do you California. think, California. Do you think that's bad? In the Owens Valley, they're selling t-shirts with pictures of Coso rock art on it. <laughs> ah. <laughs> I keep telling them, like, is, your, your stuff is really cool. Have you found, has anyone found much of uh, correlation with the astronomical uh, factor in the sites? I personally have a problem with that um, with hunter-gatherers because hunter-gatherers needed to be at a different place every year when they were moving around. This, the natural foods come available dependent on all, you know, 
both rainfall and, and temperature. And so, in my opinion, the few places that it's been well documented, it was by people who, and I'm thinking right now of a few places in the southwest and a few places over in the Chumash, uh, Santa Barbara area, where people not only went there during the equinox and the solstice, but they went in between, you know, like science, and um, checked out to see, well, oh, well, this is going on when it's not the equinox too. Hmm. And so, um, it just for me, from in my opinion, I think that it, that really doesn't hold up. And even in the places where it's been proven, I mean, I, somewhere, where was I just at? Where they're still selling uh, the video of the Fajada Butte in in uh, Chaco, well, that was debunked 20 years ago by a woman that proved that those slabs have been moving continuously for the last thousand years. But they're still selling those videos. <laughs> Stop! Um, so I just think that if people want us to believe that, they need to do more rigorous science. Um, and for in certain places with agricultural people, it makes sense. But I just, for one thing, it's not in the ethnographic record anywhere of them talking about doing it. Um, and then I just don't see why they would need to be in the same place at the same time. Um, that's not to say it didn't happen, I would just like to see more evidence for it. The second speculative tour I went on, we went up Nine Mile Canyon and turned south toward 178, and just a little bit north of 178 before you get to Kernville. Oh, okay, 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 okay yeah. Mm -hmm. There were two sites that we were taken to two rock outcroppings, and you got the right place. You said, in this notch between the mountains was the summer solstice site, or winter, and another one, another rock outcropping. You look over here, and right at this peak, it was the uh, winter solstice. And, and that was pretty convincing, looking, you know, taking compass readings. And, has anyone ever gone there besides on those two dies and to see what happens? Um, my mentor has I made a- I was told that some lady, and now we're talking about mid 80s, some lady was working on her master's thesis and she discovered, quote, discovered, quote, documented those as solstice sites. Uh, again, I'm, I have not seen that information. It's a little better than hearsay. Yeah, I would have to read the publication yeah. because presently Swansea site is, I know on the internet as being the most important site in the whole world. And um, again, I would just like to see more rigorous science given to it. And my mentor has made the point that he's never, he's done over a thousand sites. He's never seen a petroglyph site that did not have a solar interaction. The sun hits every, some petroglyph on every rock art site he's ever seen. How does that explain all the rest? You know, and even if you find, okay, now that light particular hits this circle on the solstice, well, there's 300 circles at this site on 200 panels. Why were all the rest of them made? So to me, um, the archaeoastronomy, the other thing about it is that it does, it, there is no literature for archaeoastronomy in America prior to us going to the moon. That's kind of a hint and a half for me, that no Native American ever said anything about it until it was part of our culture and we were, they were regurgitating what we had already given them. So I'm just saying my own personal thing is that um, I have a tendency to think that that's really us putting our own um, uh, worldview onto them and selling a lot of books about it. But again, I, there's no Native American ever said it first. It's, just, it's not in the ethnography. But they, they had to spend a lot of time looking at the stars. Yes. I mean, they try to go to sleep at night or wake up and you know, mm -hmm. go to the bathroom or something, look up there and you know, they must have spent a ton of time looking at the stars. Yes. And they had to have some influence on it, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, and the same thing, well, again, with the Waterman people. They have all kinds of stories related to the stars, but there's nothing linked to, oh, the, we wait here for this particular, they don't, like, why? Why would they do that? They don't need to plant crops on a particular day. They don't need to know what day it is if you're a hunter-gatherer. You just need to know when the crops are coming well. Only if you're a, an agricultural person do you ever need to know what day it is. Or if you're praying at a particular time. I mean, it was monks that came up with clocks in the, originally. But. Yeah, but the, uh, like in Mexico, there's a very com complex... Uh 
Those were not hunter-gatherers. Okay, but you're yes. this is only dealing with... That's an agricultural society that was very, very locked into specific days. So you don't, there's no advantage like with comparing more complex cultures to the south as, as far as understanding and interpreting any of this? When the Mesoamerican influence showed up in North America, the so-called Katsina cult first showed up, we see any indication of it coming up with the, um, well, the beginning of the Puebloan basket maker, pre-Puebloan pre really people, um, the first time we see that, they're already agricultural people and it completely changed all the rock art, completely changed how everybody did their ceremonies. It completely, um, pretty much wiped out any of the hunter-gatherer um, way things that were done when they showed up. So it's two separate phenomena that don't really overlap? Well, somehow the ones in, in Mesoamerica grew out of a hunter-gatherer co uh, culture. So yeah, and, and somehow that's where it, it first came out. We don't know what the roots are of agriculture, but they do seem to be a real big difference in their, um, the, the way they look at the world. Especially rock art gets a lot smaller, at least in our Southwest, you know that you're looking at Pueblo and stuff when all the anthros start to get a lot smaller and they're more like decorations in the back of a, of a room than being a big thing out on a cliff or something. Anybody else? Nope. Thank you very much. Thank you.